Welcome to Promote Profit Publish. I'm your host, Juliette Clark, and we are in the second day of the 10-day author platform building challenge. So it's not too late to jump in and participate. You can find it over on BreakthroughAuthorNewsletter.com. That's going to take you into subscribe to our LinkedIn page. And from there, our LinkedIn newsletter, you'll be able to participate in the challenge. There's no opt-in. You can follow along at your own pace, but it's not too late to get in and play with this. Um, the real benefit is being able to figure out what parts of your platform you've fully developed, what parts you haven't. And if there are parts that you haven't, starting to build that awareness, get that going. And at the end of the challenge, we are actually going to offer a workshop called the Platform Planning Palooza. And you can find that at platformplanningpalooza.com. And we're actually going to have the forms. We're going to go through what's good for you, um, what you need to work on, and then plan that out. Because we do realize that so much of this can be really overwhelming to build. So building strategically definitely will help you. Today's guest is Dame Clarissa Burt. And uh, Clarissa Burt is an internationally acclaimed award-winning media personality, producer, director, writer, author, public speaker, former supermodel, and winner of the Celebrity Survivor Show. With hundreds of television and film credits to her name, this who's who of international and American women brings over 35 years of experience in the entertainment industry in both international and American markets. Clarissa is the founder uh, and CEO of In the Limelight Media, a multimedia platform consisting of TV, radio, video, uh, and digital magazine. Her shows can be seen on Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and her podcast is heard on over 15 different distribution platforms. Her best-selling book entitled The Self-Esteem Regime um, was published by Roman and Littlefield uh, November 11th, 2021. The audiobook was published by Recorded Books two weeks later, and her book drops in Italy on November 11th, 2022, so coming up next month. She's also the first American to present on Russian TV at the Kremlin and has two private audiences with Pope John Paul II honoring her social work. As the ambassador to the United States, she actively helped African women win the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011. We're really excited to have this talk with her and find out a little bit more about Lime in the Limelight Media. Clarissa, welcome! Yay, we did it. We made it. I know, you guys. I, I, we have been trying to get this together for a month. Clarissa had some some things happen completely yeah. out of her control um, with with a relative, and so yeah. she's back. I have to tell I you, am. that is one of the most impressive bios I have ever. Oh, thank you. I I'm very so jealous that you met the Pope twice. Uh, yes, I did. I have a picture of it also on my right over there. I can see him right from here. There you go. So we were just talking about, and I don't know how much you want to share, but you wrote a book called the self-esteem regime. Great, yeah. great title, by the way. Great. Thank title. you. Thank you. And then you, you kind of shared, um, you know, it, why is it so important to you? How do you acquire it? Which was probably my first question. But then you said you wrote, you were telling me that you wrote the book and then the universe challenged yourself. Yeah, sure did. Yeah. Well, first of all, I called it a regime. First of all, it's called a regime because a regime is an organized way of doing things. And I really feel as though if you're going to, you know, put on your big girl britches and get on with it, you really need to just do it, you know, and no more excuses, no more, uh, you know, I can't, no more fear, no more fear of anything, fear of fear, fear of yourself, fear of failure, uh, but just get on with it, you know, just do it. I mean, you are not promised tomorrow. So let's just, you know, it's use the time that we have really wisely. So the regime came from that. Um, the idea of writing the book came from, you know, kind of watching my mother, my grandmother, other women in my life and seeing that there was a commonality and there was a, a common denominator. Her mom was a beautiful woman and just, I oh, don't take my pictures, never take my picture. I look horrible in pictures. And she was gorgeous and in toxic relationships with my, as a relationship with my dad, my grandmother, beautiful woman. I had to lose weight. I got to lose weight. She didn't need to lose an ounce. 
tingly. She was gorgeous. Uh, so anyway, one day she takes two diet pills. She uh, swallows them, perforates her esophagus and spends the next six weeks in the hospital. So I thought to myself, well, that was kind of silly, Grandma. I mean, I really didn't need to do this to yourself. Then I had the great fortune of working with some pretty, pretty amazing women in the modeling field um, along the way. These are you know, really the, that's called the 1% of models, the supermodels, the gals that are absolutely gorgeous creatures. And not all of them, but some of them, I could see that there were there were issues there as well with either toxic relationships or or, um, you know, abusive substances or bulimia and anorexia or whatever, you know, all the things that we do when we're not content with ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I saw this coming out. What does my mother and my grandmother have to do with the gals that I'm working with on the runway? You know, and it was obviously, you know, lack of happy, healthy self-esteem. The other reason that I thought this, this was a really great time, the book has been out now about eight months, nine months, and it was a really great time post-COVID, post-COVID when we went through so much loss, right? Loss of faith, family, friends, hope, uh, uh, motivation, uh, loss of health, loss of money, loss of jobs, loss of individuality. Who am I now? You know, that I've lost my job. Who am I now that I, and, and, and with the great decision that's happened in the, in, in the nation politically, it's been really a very challenging time. We have our kids these days, according to reports in the CDC that are saying that 44% of our middle uh, school children, high school children, and some uh, into college, age are either depressed, anxious, contemplating suicide or have committed suicide. I think today they call it unaliving themselves, but I'm old and I use the old, old words. So with that having been said, those are pretty alarming statistics. These are the kinds of statistics that are really scary. So I, I like to think that, you know, uh, uh, women definitely pick up the book, that men pick up the book, but that we have our younger generations picking up the book. I'll show you the book only because I want to show you that there are three different colors of blue here. This is my working copy. But uh -huh. the, in the, when I first got it back, it was orange, pink and, and yellow. So very bright. And certainly more, more, more uh, queued up for a female audience. The only one thing I asked for the publisher for was to come back to me with, with these three iterations of blue. And I did that because I found it to be more calming. And I also did that because I wanted men to feel comfortable picking it up. And I will, I'm really happy to say that many men have read the book and have come back to me with some really, you know, some great um, commentary about how it's helping them as well. That is amazing. What do you think? I mean, does, does anyone ever have like this perfect self-esteem? Because I would like to say I have pretty good self-esteem, but I have periods of doubt. Sure. Well, periods of, first of all, you never take a test, right? There's no self-esteem test you get a hundred on and that's it for life because life triggers you and will continue to do so. It's kind of one of those things that life will do. It ebbs and it flows. Um, I like to say the most, one of the most important things that I think my book can offer you is to, to help you learn how to st stand strong in your stead, meaning that you stay very firmly planted, very well rooted when the storm comes through, that tornado comes through, something's going to happen in your life. And you may lose a, 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 a leaf or two, uh, possibly even a branch, but you're not going to be uprooted, uplifted and, and, and transported away with the storm. Um, and that's because you will have the tools in your, in the shed, those resources that you need that will be able to serve you in order to not completely lose it or go ballistic when something you know, of grave importance um, happens in your life. So would you say this book is for someone who's become aware that they need to take responsibility for their own destiny? Because I, I feel like that part of the population that's sort of unhappy is also that blaming part of the, the population that doesn't really want to say, I, I am the master of that destiny. And if I am down today, I have to fix this. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, you can't, this is what's we call the blame game. You know, I want to blame my life on someone else. It doesn't work that way. You know, I think that, uh, you know, we can all look back and find those, oh, woe is me moments. Maybe we didn't have the most perfect parents and what I want, <laughs> you know, all of that. Right. But we also have what we take from our natal tribe, right? That's where we learn first, whatever we're taught at home. It doesn't necessarily mean that what we were taught is going to serve us for a lifetime. What I do say is take what served you and leave behind what didn't. And when I say leave behind, I don't mean forget about your parents and your family. I mean, you're always going to go home for a Thanksgiving dinner and you'll be there for Christmas and all those lovely things. But sometimes you're going to have to learn where, how to love them where they're at. And that I think is one of the most important things that I can, let me get rid of that dinging for you. Uh, The one of, you know, the most important things you can ever do is to say, I thank you for what, for the information and the education you did impart. Uh, and in part, I didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't believe at all, right? Not quite everything, but thanks again. And I'm now going to make my life my own. Um, again, and, and in doing this, remember that self-esteem work, work takes a lot of courage. And so sometimes when you go down that path, you're going to hurt somebody's feelings or their nose is going to get out of joint or they might get a little offended, but, you know, a hug and a kiss and some love and maybe even a, a slight explanation, mom, I still love you, but this is, you know, works better for me in my life. Again, with your faith, you know, our faith, what did our faith teach us that we may not necessarily always hundred percent believe in or agree with? I mean, I hate to say, but maybe it's okay to take what serves and leave what doesn't. I, I know I'm going to get a lot of backlash on that, <laughs> but you know, not everything I was taught in the Catholic faith is something I, I totally believe in. Friends, your education, the education process, uh, your peers, those sorts of things. What was it that you picked up along? So the things you pick up along the way that help form you um, are the things that you find yourself with one day. And if it's if, if things aren't jiving for you, if they're not working for you, if you're unhappy, depressed, anxious, or you're blaming, yeah, this book is definitely for you because yeah. that is, that's just not that's not that's not it. That's not what we're going for. It, it isn't. It is. And I love that you said that because I feel like part of what's wrong with society today is people who expect you to cater to their feelings. And I always I'm very unpopular in the sense that I'll say, hey, that's your stuff. Go figure it out. I'm not responsible exactly. for making You're not. your self esteem. And I think a lot of people like in their I don't know, for me, it was my mid 20s where I started to say, OK, I can't be mad at my parents for this. That's where you meet them, where you're at. And I actually have kids in my mid twenties that, you know, I told one the other day, like, it's my job to screw you up. And then for you to unscrew yourself out out, and then if you can try to figure me out, no, Uh, but absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and that's just the way that's a way of life too. There's no way around that. I have found very, very few people along the way uh, that have ever said to me, oh man, I had the most perfect childhood. (laughs) I know a lot of people who pretend they did. <laughs> I will so, say that. Yeah. So join the I- club, everybody. It just is kind of the way it is, you know. Yeah. Um, um, there's a couple other things that you know I like to I like to uh, tell people, and that is this whole "I am enough." Move. You know, I am enough. I am enough. You are enough. We are enough. He is enough, and she is enough. Well, that's all great, but if you ever look up the definition of enough, it's as much as is required. Now. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I know about me and I know I am so much more than is enough. So when I, when I worked at Shia Day, we had t-shirts that says good enough is not enough. Exactly. (laughs) Because it's right. It is not enough to be enough. And that's exactly what I say. So it's really, it's, it's one of those kinds of things that you have to be careful about. You tell your subconscious because it just might believe you. So the whole enough thing, take another really good look at that. Um, Failure is another thing we talk about a lot with self-esteem and people are afraid, you know, people are living in fear. And as I said before, you need courage to do this work. You must know that you're going to get uncomfortable with yourself. Others may get uncomfortable with you. You might have to cut some people out of your life. You know, those toxic relationships that aren't serving you, that are really pulling you back and and dragging you down may need to be, if not cut out, at least re-dimensioned. You know, you've got to be able to have the courage to, to walk away, to pull away, to stay away. And that is not always going to be a pleasant place to be. So, you know, fear again is 
face everything and rise. I don't know if that works for you, but it kind of works for me. <laughs> face no, it, just start facing everything. Stop running from everything. Um, and, 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 you know, and start your ascension toward, you know, a bigger, better, bolder, more beautiful you. Yeah. Let's talk about what you just, what you just, uh, made a point there. When you set good, you're talking about boundaries when you're talking about toxic relationships, Absolutely. when you set good boundaries, you're always going to encounter people who have gotten into a pattern, a life pattern with you. Yeah. And it can get pretty ugly and you have yeah. to learn how to stick to your guns. Yeah, you so, do. so when you're, when you're reading this book, you have to remember that, that that change is going to require that there's some hardship there. There, there are going to be some hard times because those people are going to challenge those new boundaries. Absolutely. Yeah. They're going to challenge them. Absolutely. And you might have some weak moments. It's up to you. It's on you. I mean, how, how, how quickly do you want to grow? How much, you know, a great change comes from great pain. How much pain are you in? How, how much is your, how is that working for you? As Dr. Phil would say, how's that working for you? <laughs> you know, and if it's not, then it's up to you. It's only on you. That's on no one else to be able to make those kinds of changes. Um, failure is another really great. Oh, I'm so yeah. afraid of failure. What if I feel, what if you don't, what if you don't fail? And not only, but, you know, I love the acronym for failing, which is your first attempt in learning. Right. So nothing is perfect. No, you know, nothing that was done the first time, every way, the first car that came off the assembly line, the first light bulb, it doesn't work that way. I mean, there's going to be failure along the way. And every time you fail, you're that much closer to success, which is something that I really do like to remind people. Now, I don't suggest mm -hmm. that you fail for life because I think there's <laughs> a point where, where, you know, you kind of get it and the light bulb goes off and, you know, and, and, um, and, and you, you know, you sort of understand that, there is a fear a component. There is a little bit of fear of failure component. But you know what? Again, let's just face everything and rise. And it's going to be your first attempt at learning. And it's all going to be okay. Yeah. But you know what? You and I as entrepreneurs, like I, I would say that I fail every day. It's just a matter of, am I going to curl up in the fetal position on the carpet and pick lint out of my tears? Or am I going to say, okay, what can I take away from this? And can I get up tomorrow morning with a new attitude, understand what I learned and move on? And I actually say that to my children. What was the lesson you learned? And, and they say it back to me now, which is kind of hilarious because I know they're being sarcastic, but you know, my, my kids will say that now too. And I think you really have to train yourself in, in what that, you know, how, how badly is it an epic fail? Can I fix it? Can I do something? But we always can, can learn from a failure. Absolutely. Without and a doubt. Without yeah. A especially, doubt. especially, you know, as a business owner, like how many times a day do you fail? No, exactly. Well, anyway, <laughs> moving, moving right along. Uh, yeah, I'd like to go back to boundaries for a second because it's so important boundaries. And that is that most people uh, are very uncomfortable setting boundaries for themselves. Mm -hmm. They feel as though it might even have to be done with anger or uh, in upset or, it, and it doesn't, you know, I like to call them boundaries with ease, joy, and glory. Just be able to say, you know, <laughs> just be able to explain to someone in a very kind, calm way. Hey, listen, do you mind can I talk to you for a second. Um, what you just did or what you just said, um, you know, kind of, kind of hurt my feelings. And this is why, so, you know, sometimes if you explain yourself, other people don't understand that they've done it and, you know, they may not have meant it the way it was said. Yeah. So, you know, when you open it up to that, you, what you are absolutely doing is teaching someone how you will and will not be treated what you will and will not accept. And that can be done again in, in a, with a very calm voice. Uh, and if somebody doesn't get it and doesn't want to get it, then they probably don't belong in your life. So I really, really like to underline that boundaries are absolutely important. I forget what the word I was trying to say was, but it's really super important to mm -hmm. uh, ha your happy, healthy self-esteem. How you advocate for yourself is really, really important. I mean, you, you know, if you're not, nobody's going to do it for you. You've got to do that for yourself. Obviously, if, if it hurts, and I'm going down another path here, but I will say this, if it hurts, it's not love. So be really, really careful yeah. about what you feel love is and what it isn't. If somebody's pulling you down, if someone is degrading you, if someone is yelling at you, if someone is screaming at you, God forbid they're putting their hands on you, all of that, there are ways out of those kinds of situations. And that again, takes courage and I get it, but I will <laughs> promise you that the light on, on the other side of that tunnel is so big, bold and bright 
that you're going to be really, really glad that you did. I get there's a lot of fear and I'm going off on a tangent here, but I'm very passionate about the position and condition of women. And, and again, if it hurts, it isn't love. Um, another thing I like to talk about is loyalty, because I think that, you know, when you are loyal, it's, it's just kind of make you feel good about yourself. You know, it's like, wow, you know, I, it, loyalty is when you've got my back behind my back. So, you know, those kinds of water cooler moments when you're, you know, when you're with the pack or with the tribe and they're trashing somebody, do you stand up for that somebody that's not there or do you, or do you foment and join in? Um, I think if you were, you know, if you could say, you know, I know Susie Q and that's not my experience of her. Maybe she was just having a bad day. Maybe she just needed a little extra love or hug and then walk away. And, and you'll have, I know the jaws are dropping and not that you mean to sound sanctimonious, but you kind of do want to take a higher road um, when you can, you know, it's, it's not that hard. It's really not. Yeah. That hard. Yeah. That's very true. I, I have a friend from a long time ago who is all, she has to be the queen bee. She has to be the center of attention and that trashing, and it used to irritate me. And now I'm to the point where I go, you know what? If that's what she needs to feel better about herself, that's her. I don't have to participate. And well, that's her very low. That's her lack. Yes, of that's her low esteem. The yeah. need to be, you know, felt. So you talk a lot in the book about the importance of support groups. Um, yes. Who, who are they and, and how do you, why are they so necessary for you? Well, there are people that you're going to meet along the way. Um, and it could be family. I don't know. It could, you know, everyone has a different set, if you will, of people that they have in their lives. And usually in a lifetime, you can count on your one hand, these people, uh, the ones that you can call at three o'clock in the morning is really uh, the ones that I, I kind of like to refer to those, you know, your ride or dies. Um, yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, your support groups can be larger than that, but the ones that are really, um, um, the ones that you will create those kinds of relationships with are to be absolutely nourished and cherished. Uh, and you, you know, you would do the same for them no matter what. And these are the people that, you know, um, you can tend your hand and you, you know, you're always going to, you're always going to find them there. Um, you can call at three in the morning and they're always going to pick up a phone. You can cry and you find a shoulder you, um, and you, again, by the way, this is all uh, reciprocal. My last chapter actually in the book is reciprocal. So the idea that, you know, you've got these kind of people in your life that you know that you can count on no matter what. Again, some, you know, support groups would be a little bit, lar you know, larger. Uh, I love my mastermind, for example. I, you know, I've got amazing women on my mastermind and we're all there for each other come hell or high water. I don't know that I would call all of them at three o'clock in the morning. I don't know that I could, you know, possibly do that. I haven't asked. I'm sure they would say yes, but you understand the point. And that is mm -hmm. the idea that you may be born into a family that wasn't necessarily there the way you need them to be or would like for them to be, right? That could happen. It, it, it can happen, but you can certainly create your own group and you should create your own group of really uh, close, dear, cherished friends. You definitely should. And I'm going to even add to that. You should model that for your children. So yes. it passes on to the next generation. You definitely, definitely too, because they, they see your actions, they see your loyalty and they will carry that on in their lives as well. Yeah. So, um, you frequently mention one of the tactics in the regime and w which is it? Look good, feel good, be good or greater good. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. First of all, I want to get back to what you said before. And, I, and frequently I say the toxic stops here. And that is part of the work and self-esteem that we do, right? We want to make sure that we are not projecting or we're not, uh, we are not passing on. Uh, the things that we know hurt us to others. Uh, and certainly that means mostly from parents to children. So I'm yeah. glad you did bring that up. And absolutely everything you do say or in any which way you act is what you are teaching your children to do. So it, they're pretty big shoes you have to step into when you become a parent. And at, whereas you're not perfect uh, doing the work that's in, you know, in personal development, uh, no matter which book you pick up. I mean, it could be mine. I hope it is. And if it's, you know, there's a whole billion dollar industry and in, in personal development right now that you can pick and choose from, but continue to do the work on yourself is the message. I want personally want to be a better person tomorrow than I am today. And I work on that all the time, getting back to look good, feel good, be good and greater good. Uh, what was the question? Just, you know, those are the four. So, um, what, what, what you already told us what it is. What are the most important things that we need to remind ourselves of every day in that statement? 
Um, well, absolutely. You know, I think we're talking about uh, self-esteem looking good. We always know we look good. You know, that's kind of like a little bit of the lilt in the step. <laughs> we're kind of feeling our vibe. We know that we look good, right? Because it's normal and natural that we want to look and feel our best. We just want to wow. look we, we all want to look good. We want to feel good about ourselves. And there's nothing conceited about it. That's not a narcissistic statement. It's just we look good. We want to make sure that we're, you know, we're looking good, feel good. Diet, exercise, nutrition. You know, it all works as one. And especially solopreneurs and entrepreneurs know that if this goes down, we go down, it all goes down. Oh, yeah. You know, so we definitely want to be sure that we are taking really good care of our body, our mind, and our spirit. Um, and that when you're working at home alone, especially during COVID, by the way, was really quite a challenge in at times because there were no accountability partners. And I would say, I would venture to say, <laughs> thank God for zoom. Yes. Because it really <laughs> kept us. It kept us not in the same room, but it kept us connected because there was a moment there that there was, you know, in the very beginning when we all started like, Whoa, disconnect what's happening. The dolphins are coming into the ports with the boats now. And so it was really kind of that moment where it was really touch and go for a minute. Well, you know, we, we need the connectivity. We must stay uh, in close contact uh, with one another. And so, yeah. So feel good. Uh, look good, feel good. Be good. Be good is everything we are thinking. It's our leadership. It's relationship. It's our finances. It's all of the other things in life that are not look good and feel good. So um, and, and so being really on top of our game when it comes to being good, just like being a really, really good at what it is we do. And that basically means to me and in my life, it means lots of education, lots of courses, classes, uh, staying up on top of the networking, you know, events that are coming along. I constantly want to be learning what's coming down the pike next, what's new, uh, and just staying on top of my game. I think that's the most important uh, aspect, especially again, for entrepreneurs and solopreneurs, greater good. Greater good is giving back, paying forward, tithing, volunteering, doing something you know is going to put a smile on someone else's face because invariably it's going to put a smile on yours. And it could be that little thing, you know, that you do like getting up on public transportation for the elderly or for a pregnant woman. Uh, I don't know if we, a lot of the younger generations still do these things. These were matters that we were taught at our age. Yeah. I don't know that they were taught. And I think that it's something that is sorely missing. Uh, so that's really important. Holding an elevator door open for someone. You can see the straw in to get there. Um, you know, uh, the littlest thing. Sometimes it's, gee, you look real pretty today to a lady in, you never saw before in your life. Or I love that top. Or in a supermarket, you know, silly things that can really just, you never know, you know, again, what somebody else is going through. Right. And what a kind word from you or a kind gesture from you may do. It goes a really long way in changing uh, in changing the energy in someone else's day and certainly in yours. Yeah, absolutely. I actually remember. And this is another one model for your children. When I lived in California, men quit opening doors there. Yeah. And I remember visiting my uh, son in college in Utah, and there were these nine, 10, even five-year-old boys that would run up and open the door for me. And I'd be like, oh my God, I love this state, like old yeah. fashioned, good yeah. old fashioned values. And yeah. I think we even see that, you know, if you look at the news the last couple of days with uh, the Queen of England, you know, many people are afraid that her values will die with, yeah. you know, with her. So I, a lot of that we really could bring back. Yeah. So you've introduced mirror therapy in your book. I did. Um, it was originally uh, spoken about by Louise Hayes. How does Absolutely. it work? Tell us a little bit about that. So, no, yeah. Jack Canfield used it in his book, uh, book and uh, in his work. And so did Louise Hay, which is where I heard of it, of it first. And it's those, uh, and it's, it's looks weird and it feels weird and it's kind of, it feels kind of silly at the, in the beginning when you start and you may want to have a, you know, a box of tissues close by because what you're going to do is have dialogue with yourself, which is something you never do. You're always talking to someone else, but you know, the only time you're really having dialogue with yourself is, you know, in your own head, <laughs> excuse me. It's never when you're looking at yourself and taking that deep dive through your own eyes into your own soul. And so when you can start to say, you know, uh, Juliet, I, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I, I forgive you for dot, dot, dot. I love you 
so much, you know, for whatever. So you have the, these, the prompts that are in the book. Uh, and again, thanks to the work that I know I've started Louise Hay, it might've even started before, uh, that you take this really deep dive and you do this on a daily basis. If you only do it for a few minutes, that's fine. In the beginning, that's great, but just get started. Um, because I think a lot of people live in shame. A lot of people live in blame, they blame themselves for things that, you know, they, they, they took on things that were not theirs to take on. Uh, and, uh, and this is a way of releasing. Remember, my first chapter is release. My second chapter is rebuild. The third chapter is responsibility. Where is it that you are taking responsibility for your life? And where is it that you're shirking responsibility? And, and again, when you get into this book, it, it's not, it's not, <laughs> it's going to take some work. It, it really is. Um, it, it, it takes, it takes, again, remember the courage part, because that's, that's a big part. Um, I'll read you, uh, I don't know what chapter I was in yesterday when I started to read a couple of the affirmations, just so you get an idea. This is in chapter four, which is, I forget which one, sorry, it's the chapter four, replace. Um, and uh, never compare myself to others as everyone's journey is unique. Well, God, that's one affirmation right there that if you get that one through your thick skull, you'd be 99% of the way there. How many of us, and I just picked that out of the blue. I didn't even know I was going to read that. How many of us are comparing ourselves on a daily basis on social media? How many? All of us. Oh, look at that car. Or look at her dress. Or look at her business. Or look at their husband. Or look at her kids. Or look at you know, their success. Or look at, it's, it's natural. It's intrinsic. And what I say is, you are so lucky that you get to be you. Forget about Susie Q. Susie has her own pile of stuff she's got to deal with. You're not walking in her shoes. You don't know where she's been and you don't know where she's going. It's her path and her journey. You must be worried about your own. Leave everybody else out of the picture. Leave them out of your equation. This is in the, this is chapter six. I'm just going to pick one out of the blue and say reinvent. Because how many, I know how many times I've had to reinvent uh, my life, right? Uh, yeah. Many. <laughs> so reinvent. Let's see what I have. I am so excited about who I am becoming as I map out my future. It's okay to say yes to getting up, moving on, and never looking back. I will do what is necessary to complete my reinvention and conquer the world. Now, there are many more you know, affirmations here. I've only chosen three. But when you think uh, that, and that's just part of a chapter. I mean, we have Clarion Call, Clarissa's Corner. We've got Review. We've got Case Studies. We've got the Affirmations. Each chapter is so chock full of the resources I talked about before that you need to have in the shed when that storm comes through. And the other thing, Julia, is that when you read the book today and you read it eight, nine months from now, it's going to be a completely different read. You're going to get things out of it the second time you read it that you never even saw the first time because you weren't ready for the message then, just like many other books you'll read. Mm -hmm. So I really think that, again, when we talk about the importance of this book, it's, it, 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 again, it's kind of like an ebb and flow. Where are you in the moment and how can it serve you for where you are now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then help you as you move forward. Oh, that's amazing. This has been amazing. Thank you. Where can we find you and where can we find the book? Where, where are you distributed at? Well, thanks. Um, you know, I am uh, Clarissa Burt pretty much straight across the board on social media. So that's pretty simple. And then the book is in uh, uh, Barnes and Noble. So you can buy it in the Barnes and Noble stores. You can find it online uh, on Amazon, uh, Kindle and Audible. Ah, nice. That's the way I listen to most everything is audible these days. <laughs> would you, let me just ask you, would you recommend, is, is it, is, are there, are there exercises in it? It would it be something that you would maybe listen to on audible and then buy the soft cover and work the exercise? Well, that's a good question because I'm, I'm working toward the workbook right now. Right now, what you do is you, you have your own workbook and you, you know, you find a notebook and you jot things down that we do a lot of journaling. Boy, the power of journaling is really something else to be, yes. you know, to be, it's pretty, pretty spectacular. Let me just leave you with one more little one. Let me see what I've got here in the way of, um, there, you know, it's the, the final clarion call. And I just love clarion call. I just absolutely love that. Maybe because it was the beginning of my name as well. C-L-A-R, I don't know. But um, here you can see there's Clarissa's Corner. We've got, you know, the review. There's all kinds of really great stuff in here. 
the affirmation, this is reciprocal. Uh, I will donate my time and money to good causes and open my heart and soul to others. I will be financially generous to others as I, as much as I can afford. And that just, there's something different for everybody, but yeah. you know, it's, if you can, if you can, whatever you can do, do it. And sometimes it's a couple of cans of beans at the food drive. You know what I mean? Um, it doesn't have to be broad stroke. Sometimes it's just those little things that, that, you know, you're adding to a, a greater, a greater good. And, and that can kind of make you feel good too. Right. Um, I will be a kind person, even to those who have offended or hurt me. Wow. Okay. I don't know if you know how powerful that is. Just Very. that one affirmation, just that one affirmation can change a life. Here's something else I'll leave you with. And that is, you know, we always say, Oh, I can do anything. I can do any, I can do anything. Well, okay. You can do anything until you can't. And what I mean by that is tomorrow is not promised, mm. right? So who is it that you can make amends with, apologize to, ask forgiveness from, reconnect with, thank? Who is it that you need to be picking up a phone uh, and just sort of saying, hey, how are you? It's been a while. You know, when you do these little things, not only again, are you making yourself feel really great, but you're making someone else feel really good too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, and so I think that that is always, yeah, tomorrow isn't, yeah, you can do anything almost not everything. I mean, NASA's not going to call me tomorrow and I'll be on the moon next week. So I don't think that's going to happen, <laughs> <laughs> but you can do many things, but tomorrow is not promised. So do the right thing you know, do the right thing. That's so, thank you for sharing that. That's so wonderful. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much, Julia, for your time.